Hello, my dears. Having a little funky thing going on <laughs> for some reason with uh, one of my videos, but it's lovely to be here. Um, Deborah Roth here from Spirited Living, back with another edition of our uh, playing with diving into embodying our divine feminine, our inner goddess team personified in the divine feminine. Thank you, thank you for being with me. Um, and boy, what a week, uh, what a day. We are honoring the a very, an, a, an actual person, um, Teresa of Avila, who is a Catholic mystic and saint. And while you know, those of you that, that have joined me here before know that my focus is on really bringing back, really um, inviting back the divine feminine in, in everywhere, in all of our lives, because I do truly passionately believe that the qualities of the divine feminine, of empathy and honoring our emotions and our intuition and, and honoring our bodies, honoring the earth, honoring nature, are what is going to save our world. <laughs> so... And you can see more about that if you go to the and learn more about the Divine Feminine um, when this gets to my YouTube channel, which is usually Thursday night. Um, there's a little spot that you can click that, that says here if you want to find out more about the Divine Feminine. So mostly, obviously, what I do here is, is really focus on goddesses from around the world. And some, and it's been quite a journey. I've been doing this for about three years, more than three years now and have have explored so many and occasionally i've done actual people i've done amazing women mystics like julian of norwich um hildegard von bingham uh if you go to my youtube channel and search for them you will find them there this one i have heard about but i did not grow up catholic so i wasn't familiar with her and she is quite extraordinary, even in the realm of saints, and especially in the way that she divided, embodied, of course, they didn't call it that then, the sacred feminine, the divine feminine. Teresa of Avila was born in the Middle Ages in the 1500s, and she, her father was, had grown up in a Jewish family during the Spanish Inquisition, and so they were forced to convert to Catholicism. And it was discovered somehow by the authorities, the, the religion police, that they were practicing Jewish traditions at home. Most likely, since, since so many beautiful Jewish traditions are actually in the home, it was probably his mother or his grandmother. So they were paraded through the streets um, and, and castigated and anti-Semitic slurs thrown at them for seven Fridays consecutively. And, and forced to kneel at the shrines of, of all the Catholic, Catholic shrines around Toledo, which is where she grew up in Spain. So her father was um, very determined that his own children, his own family, would not experience that kind of humiliation. So he really towed the line during the Inquisition. And his daughter was... Um, was a very, she was a very active, gregarious, charming, witty, lively uh, girl, and then young woman, and she truly embodied um, all of the the, the Catholic um, traditions and and all of the the prayers and the connection to God and to Jesus, beautiful to the divine, and she, in fact, when her mother died when she was twelve, giving birth to her ninth child she turned to the Mother Mary for solace and, and, and developed a very deep connection with her. However, by 16, she, her, her personality, she was just this lively, vivacious, by that time, young woman, and got into some kind of trouble, some sort of awful thing, and she never really says what it was. We don't know if she held hands with a boy. We don't know if she, uh, if her, if she gave up her virginity. We don't know what it was. But her father sent her off to a nunnery to, um, to, to educate her, <laughs> in other words, to control her. And she fought it because she was such this, you know, this active, vivacious creature. And slowly, uh, over, over time, she came to relish the silence, which before had been in a very busy household, anything but that. And, and to the point, rebel that she was, 
to the point where she then decided that she wanted to become a nun. Her father tried to talk her out of it and she persisted. And probably for about the first 20 years or so, she, she really, um, she, she, she didn't, she struggled. She had a lot of questions and struggles and physical ailments and, and the, the presumption was that that was because this um, vow of self-isolation that she had taken was really kind of out of character for her. Now, I will tell you right off the bat, there, if you, if you <laughs> Google Teresa of, of Avila, you will find so many things. I have a, one beautiful image of her. And it's, so this is, this is one of hers as a, as a young, um, it's, it's a young version of her, but she really came into her own, her own in her late 30s when she was more middle-aged. I found out so much through her. I first really identified with her through this wonderful book that I've, I've actually um, highlighted in my, in my newsletter, maybe at least once when I read it a year or so ago. Um, it probably comes through backwards. It's Wild Mercy uh, by Mirabai Starr, who's a wonderful writer, living the fierce and tender wi wisdom of the women mystics. And she was uh, particularly deeply connected. She considers Teresa her, her, her uh, matron saint, and in fact, translated two of her books. So that's how extraordinary she was. Not only was she it got into this deep contemplative place, but she was a beautiful writer. She was a very um, vital writer and, and wrote several. The two that Mirabai translated were um, uh, Intimate, let's see, let me find it, Intimate Castles, I believe it was, Interior Castles, sorry, and The Book of My Life. So I encourage you to, to um, write, read Wild Mercy's Mirabai Star's book and then go do some research on your own. Um, now, what happened to her in her late 30s is that she had this mystical, this this um, rapturous experience when she was walking through one of the hallways um, in, in the convent. And there was a, a statue of Jesus that they had taken down from its place in the wall because they were cleaning it for some big celebration. And when she when she lifted it up to replace it, she had this... this um, deep, deep connection with his eyes. And that completely shifted her life. She, he became her beloved, which is one of the ways that, that they, that in this kind of deep Catholicism, this deep spiritual connection, um, that these people, uh, you know, that these mystics had, um, she dedicated her life to him. And in fact, had so many visions and raptures and, um, uh, and and uh, what was the other word that they used? Voices and heard voices to the extent that the inquisitors, remember this is still during the Spanish Inquisition, um, sought her out and wanted to and, and investigated her and wanted to be sure that all of this was not as a result of consorting with the devil, but rather was really from from the divine. And what they discovered, they asked her to to record all of her. Um, all of her spiritual experiences from as, as far back as she could remember. And they were so charmed by her, by her wittiness, by her, her, um, her devotion that they cleared her in spite of, in spite of themselves. So, and then at some point she, soon after that, she was canonized by the church in 1970. She became, I believe the first, and I think there's only four of them doctors of the Catholic church. That's how revered she was and still is in, in the Catholic religion. So I invite you, even if you're not Catholic or if you're an elapsed Catholic, um, to, to, to get, and, and this happens to me when I go into a traditional church of, of my childhood, which I don't completely identify with um, at this point, but I do, I do believe that there's so many paths to, to the divine. So when you hear the words of God or Jesus, Jesus, think of the divine, think of whatever your connection is with, with spirit. And she is one to call on when, you, when you're ready, when you're yearning to take a retreat, to, to really embrace the contemplative life yourself. Interestingly about her though, is that she wasn't just about, as we know, because it, you know, for 20 years it was hard on her, she wasn't about isolating herself. She was about contemplation, but at the same time about acts of service and being out in the world. One of, I loved one of, let's see if I can find some of these quotes. Um, let's see. 
one of them from her book, um, from, from Mirabai's book. Oh, uh, uh, you'll find God within the pots and in, in the pots and pans talking about how connected um, to reality she was. This, and then she wrote many, and in fact, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna chant for you as I often do at the end of, of these calls, but I wanna give you a moment of contemplation too. I'll give you just, just one now, but I'm, then, then I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and just kind of take in some of these other beautiful words. The important thing is not to think much, but to love much. And so to do whatever best awakens you to love. Isn't that beautiful? So I encourage you to, to think about how she represents. She was all about, as, as these women mystics really were um, from, from medieval times, from the Middle Ages, they were all about finding the divine within, which is a very divinely feminine concept. And, and the, the, the concept of, of imminence, meaning finding God within, as opposed to transcendence, which means looking for God outside you. So she's, she's someone to invoke when you feel like you need some support to take that inner journey. And in fact, her interior castles is, she talks about, I think it's eight separate mansions within the castle. And within each one, there are rooms and they take you in a spiral journey into whatever awakens you to love. I love that, Renee. Um, she takes you into a spiral journey, which of course, any of you who know me know that spiral is my symbol. Um, at, in, in this interior journey, more and more to your center, to your deep soul self, to where the soul, I call it the circle of one in the work that I do, um, where God, where spirit, where soul resides. So I invite you to kind of take that in, take a moment now just to close your eyes and, and let me share with you some of these wonderful quotes. And remember, if, if God language is, is not yours, substitute in your mind the divine or spirit, whatever feels right for you. Okay. Christ, spirit, has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassionately on this world. Yours are the feet with which she wakes to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. How's that for embodied? This is a, a, a fun one. From silly devotions and sour-faced saints, good Lord deliver us. She had a sense of humor. Here's another beautiful one. Just take it in, take, take it in as you inhale. Accustom yourself continually to make many acts of love for they enkindle and melt the soul. And one last one. The surest way to determine whether one possesses the love of God is to see whether he or she loves his or her neighbor. Does that sound familiar? These two loves are never separated. Rest assured, the more you progress in love of neighbor, the more your love of God will increase, the more your love of the divine will increase. So I invite you to just take in these beautiful words. She was such a, a vibrant writer of Teresa of Avila. Please like the video, this video, you'll find it uh, along with descriptions and resources and everything else on my YouTube channel, um, by, usually by Thursday nights. And, and join me on YouTube if you're, if you're not subscribed there. And, and, and I, I leave you with the invitation, as I said earlier, to ask yourself, where in my life do I need to create those moments of quiet contemplation? And then allow yourself to create some of those. Blessed be. Thanks so much for joining me.